I want to welcome you guys to the Victor Mark Show. We've got an incredible guest today, both a friend and a fellow veteran, Kenny Thomas. Now, there are many of you that are listening that, well, sadly, you're not even going to know what he's most famously uh, known for, which is the Battle of Mogadishu and the book and movie Black Hawk Down, because while well, you're just a younger generation and maybe a half a step away from uh, things we've done and in our lifetime, but I want to encourage you to just drink in the insight, wisdom, and knowledge that this brother is going to uh, offer today on both leadership and resiliency and just life in general. And uh, by the end of our time together, we're also going to give real practical solutions and next steps on what we need to do to make our country um a better place to live for everyone and in a way that I think bring God glory because uh, it's we're living in tough times. But he, for context, in the summer of 1993, Staff Sergeant Kenny Thomas was deployed to Mogadishu, Somalia. He was with 3rd Battalion, 3rd uh, Ranger Battalion. Their mission was to capture a criminal warlord. And on the 3rd of October, Kenny and his fellows rangers distinguished themselves in an 18-hour firefight that would later be recounted on a highly successful book and movie, Black Hawk Down. Uh, 19 Americans gave their lives, 78 were wounded in the worst urban combat seen by U.S. troops since World War II. And, um, you know, on that, the movie, Kenny, I don't know if I ever told you, but uh, actually I saw the film in a theater with uh, Gary Walsh. Uh, Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, that uh, a few of us went when it came out and, uh, you know, it was extremely powerful. And I'm glad that you're here with us today on the Victor Mark Show. And help us understand, because there's so many people listening who maybe even saw the movie, read the book, but they've never experienced what it's like to be in combat, uh, you know, whether it's terror, whether it's uh, you're groped with fear or fatigue or uh, anger. Can you share kind of your insight on what that battle was like for you, that firefight in particular? Yeah, I, that's a good question. Usually people give you, they'll, Victor, they'll usually go, so tell us about that day. Right. Like, well, you got a couple of, we need, I need a couple of beers and like a lot of hours. Right. And, right. but I can tell you emotionally, I do obviously where I'm at in my life. Now the story evolves yeah. with my life. So where I'm at in my walk and my faith and my, and who I want to be, there's different things that I take from that battle, but emotionally in the thick of it, uh, you know, you'd be surprised the the lack of fear and those things that you think should be there. Mm. We just, we just didn't, I didn't experience that with a lot of guys. I think because we were so focused on taking care of one another right. and really man, every, every story, you know, if we got into stories about the battle, I, the, every single one of them will illustrate that point that the, the, the thing that I've taken from that, you know, decades later is one, the value of the person they, that's mm. on your left and your right, because by the grace of God, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for those people. Mm. And then two, the, the accountability that you have to the people on your left and your right is a choice that you make. Nobody told somebody to run out into the road and put their body uh, as a shield for other people. Nobody told these two guys, Gary Gordon and Randy Shugart, to move on foot to to crash site number two with no support, with 200 bad guys coming. Nobody made them do that, Mm. but they do it for a very simple reason. And it's, it's for each other. So that's the thing that where I'm at now in my life. And when I go out and I do these speaking engagements or when I talk to folks, that's the, that's the message I try and get to them. Victor is, man, you got to take care of one another because in the end, that's how we're getting out of here. Nobody takes the hill alone. And it's so basic and so core to us as humans, that connection to each other. And I think the people that have been in a, been in a firefight or just even people who've worn the boots right, right, 
have had that connection, which is why it's a, it can be a struggle when you get out of the military and you no longer have that connection because at your core, we need it as humans. It's a spiritual thing. So Kenny, uh, would you attribute to some of that camaraderie and bonding and brotherhood due to training, right? Uh, where you're kind of, you go through, I mean, training's not easy, neither is war, but you train hard, you, you develop a sense of dependability and trust. And then when put in that situation, uh, you do, you know, the little I've experienced, I, you know, in Iraq and Mosul against ISIS, you do realize, man, it is absolutely, you have to depend on your team. And, um, uh, you care more about that typically than dying. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. And you, you hit it. Uh, we have a saying that you, you, we train as you train as you fight, fight as you train, which means you'll only be as good as you prepared yourself to be the value. And then you hit another word, Victor, which was trust. And I, I think if you sit down and look at any of these leadership manuals or any of the leadership books out there, that word is always going to come to the forefront. That's the idea that you're, you're trying to create that trust and that bond between people. And the way that you accomplish that is through tough, realistic yeah. training. And, you know, you ask, you know, you've got guys over there working with you. You ask Jeff Teagues, you ask, uh, go ask horse, ask any of those, of those dudes who, who have trained at that level with the units. And they'll tell you the point of it is to get to, we do the basics well all the time and we become pro at what we do, but it's that shared hardship going through the difficulty together, going through the suck is what we call right. it together brings people it unifies. It's the quickest way to bring a, a group of men and women together as a team is, is put them through some shared hardship, which is why it, it, I see a lot of times people like they'll go out and do like a social hour and call it team building. You're like, yeah, you know, it's yeah. nice to do a social hour, but that's not building a team. And it because what's going to happen is when you get down into the fight and the fight comes to you. You'll only be as good as you prepared yourself to be. But if that trust is there, people won't even think twice about putting their own life on the line. Whereas now let's contrast that to what we have out here in the real world. And I, I'm adamantly against selling everybody short. I right. don't believe that people are really out there for themselves. I think that's the lie we've been told. And so we start to believe it. You tell yourself something enough every day, you begin to believe these things. And we're starting to figure, oh, well, you know, nobody takes, you gotta look out for number one and nobody's really got my back. You gotta watch your back, Jack. It, that's not, I don't think that's really true. Yeah. I think people really do wanna connect. I think they do wanna be there for each other. I agree completely. They just haven't had the training. <clears throat> yeah, or the right people to be around. Yeah, here, agree. you know, here at our leadership training center, we, uh, the first thing we do when people come in as groups or teams or whatever, we take them and pretty much right to the mat and kind of grind them, <clears throat> break them, let them know, hey, whatever ego you have, it, it's about to get exposed, uh, you know, by being choked out or whatever, uh, or them facing their fear <laughs> or, you know. That'll and, do it. Right. It's like, okay, tap. I'm tapping. And then we can move into all the other stuff. What, what we're teaching up to the range to situation awareness. Uh, and we're so thankful that you're part of this uh, because of what your company, your organization does. But uh, we'll get into that more in a little bit. So I, I think it's good for people just to understand because there's always a longing in most men's hearts to war, to be a warrior. And, you know, I, I, some will never join the military. And I always, there's two things I hear. It's like, oh man, I wish I would have joined the military. And I said, well, we all couldn't. So uh, thanks for keeping our nation together back home uh, while, you know, others served. And the other thing I hear from veterans, and actually me and Teagues, we were, we were flying somewhere in the airport, had my canine, 
And a vet walked up to us and was like, hey, man, oh, great, love you, dog. Uh, and he's, we started talking. We gave, up, we gave him our background, and he goes, yeah, man, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I got deployed, but I, I never left the wire. And, you know, I mean, I never did anything. And, of course, Colonel Teagues rips into him right away. <laughs> Right. Yeah. He just, well, did he give him the one percent speech? <laughs> like you're the one percent, and and he's yeah. just like Quit selling you, yourself short. Yeah, you raised your <laughs> hand. You did the deal. You you know, uh, and and I would say that to a lot of people listening because they'll consider you a hero. There's a movie, you know, and a book, and and they can be the hero of their own story where they are as a family person, as a, a faithful worker in the lane they're running in, right? Because we're all called to run in different lanes. But the the thing that we have in common is being prepared, training, uh, having a sense of, you know, value in what you do and excellence and never giving up is, I mean, that's in, in this world today, man, people, even when I'm speaking, you know, at Fort Benning or different bases, resiliency among new recruits going into the military, resiliency is is like some, you know, wild unicorn that they see every once in a while, and most just don't have it. So what would you tell the young person, because of your experience, and, and, and what would you tell, how does a young person experience resilience? So that, wow. There's a there was a whole bunch of uh, y'all should listen to that wisdom. There was a bunch <laughs> of it in there. Um, I, I, I was listening. I'm hearing these words. Uh, the the I don't know that you again resiliency comes from the effort that you're going to put forth to push through the suck, whatever that may be, whatever that may look like in your in your lifetime. So. Let me, I, I, I'll, the best way I can do this, if you got a second, Victor, yeah, let me tell you a yeah. quick story mm-hmm. and, and I can put it into uh, perspective for everybody. So the mission that we had on that day was to go do a raid. We were supposed to hit a target building, we were supposed to get a couple bad guys or HVTs most wanted. And then the trucks would drive, the Delta guys and the Rangers would go in, they'd hit the building, they'd grab the bad guys, the trucks would drive up and the bad guys, they'd take the bad guys away. It went down like, that's pretty much how it went down. 35 minutes later, we were done. And that's when the first helicopter got shot down and it, the call sign was super six ones. Mm-hmm. And so the Black Hawk Down thing came from, you know, everybody had a radio on, and everybody had the same freak. And you could hear people going, there's a Black Hawk going down. And we're all looking up in the sky and he's only about 200 feet off the deck. So he's a, he's a low flying target. And we see it going down and it's super six one it's cliff walcott's bird we knew who it was and instantly nobody had to be told what was going to happen you know we're not like okay well that sucks wow uh what should we do now we knew exactly what was going to go down and and we're going to move and we're going to help those guys so there's a couple of lessons you can get from this one and and the first one is I can describe to the, anybody how we felt when that helicopter went down. Mm. We're all watching it happen, and it is the exact same human emotion that you would have if when something happens that you didn't want to happen, you didn't see it coming. You get that phone call, hey, dad's in the hospital, mm. and you need to get here tonight. Mm. Or, God forbid, something happened to your kid. And the, the attorney sends you an email saying, hey, can you sign these divorce papers? She's not going to be there when you get home from this deployment. Or, man, even the, the, what we're going through as a nation right now, we're looking at the crash and we're saying the same thing everybody says. Mm. I can't believe that's happening. Holy cow, that, I can't believe that. And that's okay because that's a human reaction. So, okay, take that step back. But here's what I want everyone to understand when, when adversity hits you, it's okay to go, I can't believe it's happening, but it is happening Mm -hmm. and it's happening to you. And the sooner that we can come to grips with the fact that it's happening to us, the sooner we can understand that it's happening to the people on our left and our right. 
And that's when you have a choice to make. So rather than train someone how to be resilient, what I know that I can do out here is I can talk to people and say, it's going to come down to a choice. Mm. You're going to hit these hard times. I can guarantee you with 100% guarantee that life will hit you and the Blackhawk's going to start going down. And I don't tell them, here's what I want you to do. Because do the right thing is too easy to say. What I'll ask them is, who do you want to be in that moment? Mm, that's good. And do you want to be that person that is part of the solution? Do you want to be the person who just helps? Or do you want to be the person that, you know, I, I, I'm tapping out on this one. Lead, follow, or get out of the way are the three choices. And, and they're, all value, they're all valid choices. For us, guys like you and me, guys like Teagues, uh, we don't, getting out of the way really isn't our thing. So we're probably going to be the lead or the follower. Mm. And we're going to move towards the problem. The resiliency comes because the choice you've made outweighs the suck. Right. Yeah. And the choice almost comes down to there are people counting on me um, and I need to deliver. People who believe they're part of something, Victor, are the people that will step up. Yeah. Yep. And I, I have found that in times of crisis, <clears throat> whatever it is, the real leaders do surface. Uh, it may, you know, some people are leaders in name only, but but when the caca hits the fan, then you see the real leaders just naturally rise up. You're seeing it in our time right now. You know what I try to encourage young people is to get to the place where Kenny Thomas is or Jeff Teagues, it, you have to endure we, we call it the suck. You have to endure the uncomfortable things of life and press through to build that level of endurance of engaging something that's wholly uncomfortable. Uh, but then you have that level of confidence to go, I can, I know I can do it. I, you know, I've done it 50 times before I can do it now. Uh, right. Stepping out of your comfort zone is where we learn. Yeah. You, know, you, you got to, if, if we just keep coasting, we, we don't get better. Right. And I mean, I, I've got, yeah. I've, I've got a, a fellow I know here who, man, all he did was complain and belly about his life every step. And finally, I'm just like, dude, shut up. I mean, tell me, tell me how much you're complaining is making a difference, you know? and uh, find a solution about it or press into it. Uh, but doggone it, man, you're wearing me out. Yeah. You know, you're wearing me out. So, yeah. <laughs> Be part of the solution. If it, if it, it, the challenge probably is that particular individual, Victor, didn't, didn't feel, they didn't understand their story. They didn't understand that their story matters. And they felt like, a, they felt like a player, an insignificant player in the story. And they didn't, think they were part of the solution. So all they knew to do was stand there and, and, and bitch about it. Right. And I mean, that's, that's where the, I, the message that when I'm standing on a stage and I'm talking to folks, that's the message I try and get across in them is like, you're so much more capable than maybe you give it. We're magnificent at selling ourselves short. Let's put it that way. Man, totally. <laughs> and we're so we're capable of so much more but you have to have a reason to push yourself through that. And that's what we're trying to find. And that's what every pastor's trying to do out yep. there. Uh, you know, hey, here's, here's this thing, here's Jesus, here's God, here's this thing. And they're trying to get people motivated to find a reason to push through. And the, the, simple, the simple answer is, if you've got the people on your left and your right, and you know that they've got your back and you have theirs and that you're responsible for them and they're responsible for you, that, that will go oh my gosh. A, a lifetime yeah. of, of inspiration and motivation to get you to do difficult things because you're doing it for others. Now, you just said two things, inspiration and motivation. 
So motivation, I find, is kind of it's short term, it's temporary, but it's a kick in the pants. That inspiration is something longer term where you know who you are, just like you said. You realize you have a mission and a purpose in life. And that's what a lot of people fail to recognize. And then they flounder uh, versus going, well, God placed me here for a reason. What, what is it? Men, women who get out of the military, uh, they struggle because maybe they were in a high speed position, did a lot of things. And now they're, you know, they're at Walmart or, you know, stocking shelves or, you know, digging a ditch or something. And they're just going, what, yeah, what am I doing? What am I doing? What, well, that, I, I think right now that I, without making us pointing fingers and, and saying, you, you know, whatever it is you're doing is never going to be as worthy as what you did when you wore the boots, right. because that's a trap we'll fall into. But right now we're all feeling it. And if, when people ask me, Hey man, how's it going? I know what my answer is supposed to be. <laughs> my answer is supposed to be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm this guy that's inspiring others. And the silver lining in all this is certainly that I've been able to spend more time with my family and get to see my kids change daily. But it, in, in total transparency, Victor, I'm struggling yeah. with the lack of, connection i've always been in front of people one way or the other, whether it was music or whether it was leading or whether it was honest uh talking and speaking i've always felt like what i was doing still was purposeful and it's tough like I, so i get it I, I i i was not immune when i got out of the military to not to lo having a lost sense of purpose but I had music, so it happened really quick for me. I was easy. I had something I was passionate about, so I didn't have that long transition. But I'm feeling it now. Yeah. And so I can relate to a lot of people out there. If you're like me and you and Jeff and guys who are looking for this purpose, um, and we're not allowed to, I. The, the church is even shut down. Oh, like we, yeah. I can't go in and yeah. I can't go in and hang with the band. Right. I, you know, so I, I get it. It's a tough one. But again, it's just an obstacle and it's just a choice. Yeah. Because there is another side to it. And you got to have you got to make that choice that getting to the the positive side of it is is worth the effort. It is. You know, in the Marines, we have a saying three things, adapt, overcome, and eat crayons. Okay, yeah, so, <laughs> color and eat them. But adapting and overcoming is, is it's so important uh, in people's lives to go, you may be out of work, you may be out of a mission, you may be struggling, uh, you know, this whole pandemic deal, uh, a certain leadership that we are, uh, that we well, we look around and go, oh my gosh, this person's making decisions for us that's going to affect us. But we have to hold tight, adjust, right? And uh, and I love what um, what we're looking at doing here with our uh, leadership summit, which of course you're involved in. Yeah. And uh, that to me, because uh, I you know I love the work we're doing and. But that to me is kind of a next step for helping people once we get some leaders together, formulate a plan of action that hundreds of thousands of millions of people can follow and be part of. That's how I see it. Uh, I mean, our social media last month, 52 million people, you know, engaged with us or whatever through social media. Uh our Dib Daily Intelligence Brief, which you've contributed to and been part of, uh, I think we're at seventy thousand people already that receive emails every morning. So we have an well, think of, Yeah, think, think about that, Victor. For, so what you had said earlier about the people who are making decisions for us. So let's say the elected uh, officials. I would be lying to you if I hadn't, and I'm sure you've thought. I'm like. I, should I run for office? Right. Because I, oh, like, right. I, right. I don't, I'm a professional. I'm in the middle of writing a leadership course 
And I forgot how many leadership manuals we had to go learn and how much information we were taught. Like we're professional leaders. We've been taught how to do it. And it's, it's a little unfair of us to think that everyone out there should get it. It's like a diesel mechanic thinking that I'm supposed to know how to, my tractor works because it's so simple to him. And not everybody understands leadership. And then, so I started thinking, I'm like, well, gosh, none of these elected people seem to know what they're doing, but I, I can't think that they're all bad. I think that they just, the system is stacked against them. Half the people will support them. Half will dislike them just because. So I think the answer Thus, this leadership summit that we're putting together is just what you said. With 70,000 people, that's, that's a responsibility right. and that's a constituency. Oh, yeah. yeah. More than so than most local politicians have. So we have, a, we have a, an ability to reach people with a message. And so the idea, we get together, okay, let's come up with the message. So for, and this, the challenge that I ran into on the front end of this, Victor, and, and for people to give everybody context of what we're talking about, we want to put together like a league of justice, like a, a group of thought leaders and influencers uh, with, from diversified backgrounds, educators, coaches, athletes, uh, special operations guys, military pastors. We want to get these people at a round table and start saying, what are some of the you know, go through the mission planning process. W w w let's recon what's happening out there and what are the real issues, not just what the news is telling us or Facebook is telling us or the little one minute sound bites are telling us. What's really happening out there in your communities? And Kimmy. And then we sit down, and this is a special forces mission. Yes. And then we sit down and we go, okay, how do we attack that problem? Everybody goes back to their, their lane, everybody goes back to their area of expertise and we are unified on the message that we want to start spreading and now victor's group is, has seventy thousand. kenny has thirty thousand. you know tim tebow has a hundred thousand uh when we start putting these putting the message out there and sooner or later it starts taking yes and that's that's the idea behind it i love it you know what those of you listening and watching uh it, it's it's interesting because you know you do start wondering, should I run for office? We had people contact me to consider running for a congressional position. And our final take on it, on, you know, currently was I would actually lose the level of influence I have if I grabbed the seat in Congress versus what we have now. So knowing what your mission is, how you can make the greatest impact matters. And you know what? If you don't mind, I want to pick this up uh, on tomorrow's broadcast and let's just build on that because I know people watching and listening are very interested to go. I love this idea of a Justice League, something at a grassroots level that really can allow the average person to wrap their mind around what is happening and how do we affect positive change, not just sit here and listen to people complain again and again on the news or social media. Yeah. What's the solution? Because we are solution oriented men. So will you join me tomorrow? Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Kenny. And uh, let's pick this up tomorrow.